Horror is a genre that in today's landscape is ever-evolving, but believe it or not, there was a time when it was thought to be a momentary fad, repetitive and going nowhere creatively. That is until, of course, Wes Craven came in with the biggest shakeup to a genre maybe ever with Scream. These movies have long been comfort films of mine, and since I'm the death ranking guy, I figured what better series to do than one of my favorite slashes of all time. So that's what we're doing, all the deaths in all the movies. And remember, this is all just my personal opinion, and feel free to let me know what you think of the list after you watch the video. Opening up very strong, we have potentially the most iconic death in the series, the phone call scene with Casey Becker. Now, I'm probably going to talk about it a lot over the course of this video because Scream is an extremely innovative story as its main purpose is to take everything you think you know about slashers and turn it on its head. At this time, the most prominent slashers were Freddy and Jason, two supernatural ghouls that were unstoppable forces of nature. This scene sets the tone for an entirely different kind of world. Casey is minding her own business and Ghostface calls her, seeming innocent at first, letting the tension build up and until it's clear that she's in extreme danger. Her boyfriend Steve is revealed dead, but that happened off screen, so it doesn't get its own ranking. When the chase happens, it also shows a different tone for this series. Ghostface moves like a frenzied human being, someone who is, while clearly psycho and hunting Casey down, it's just a person underneath that mask. It's a decent contrast to someone like Jason or Michael Myers who just walk forward like a killing machine. The ultimate capstone to the opening kill, Casey is caught and stabbed to death while her parents are within earshot, and then her labored breaths are all they hear over the recorded phone. Man, do you guys remember when every phone in your house was connected? I'm old. Anyway, I know it might be controversial due to this being the first entry in the video, but it's my video, so I do what I want. I'm giving this scene a perfect 10. It immediately shows you what you're in for. It's a ride like nothing you've ever seen before, and that doesn't even mention the fact that Drew Barrymore was all over the promotional material, leading a lot of people to believe that she was the main character, and they kill her in the first 10 minutes. I think that's, you know, pretty funny. This scene relies heavily on the tension that something is afoot more than an actual like chase scene or something like that as Ghostface himself is only on screen for a grand total of 13 seconds. While the principal was a bit of a hard ass, he did seem earlier in the film like he cared about his students' well-being and it's unclear whether Ghostface killed him as like f*** the principal or they knew that stringing him up would cause the necessary distraction later in the film. It's an okay kill and that little Freddy cameo from Wes Craven was top notch. So all in all, I'm going to put this at a 5, it's the baseline for for just okay for the rest of the video. While Scream may be a parody in some ways, or a meta-reflection on a genre, it doesn't really shy away from leaning on tropes just to show you how unpredictable it really is. In this case, Tatum's decision to run off into a dark garage by herself is what causes her undoing. She has a little bit of banter with Ghostface, and why anyone would assume that someone who had the full costume was just playing a joke on them under the circumstances is beyond me, but also it was the 90s, I was, I was too young to understand the culture. Also with the actual death, the garage door thing, and the doggy door. I'm not exactly a garage doorologist, but I have to assume that there's some form of mechanism in place to like, you know, not snap someone's neck in half. It's creative at the least, so I'm gonna give it a little bit of a bonus. I think it's fair to say that this is like a seven out of 10. <laughs> Kenny is a pretty insignificant character in this movie, but the film really knows how to play with tension. I'm gonna say that a lot for the rest of the video, I'm sorry. I get a tension counter on the screen. Both from the opening of the scene with Randy talking to Jamie Lee Curtis as he's in the exact same scenario to the delay on the live feed. Like I said, this was the 90s. A 30 second delay would cause lawsuits today. It almost gives the illusion that Ghostface is supernatural because he's able to appear outside the van when he was just on the screen, but he's very much natural and it's just a caveat of the technology. This scene is an 8 out of 10. I don't care how irrelevant Kenny is. Deal with it. <laughs> To absolutely nobody's surprise, Stu Mocker is my favorite character in the first film. I'm not crazy, he's just funny, and Matthew Lillard plays the role perfectly. Unfortunately, despite all the good scenes he's in and his ability to raise that tension, he just kind of goes berserk when he's caught, and yeah, he gets fried by the TV, and that's kind of creative, but it's like not anything special. I don't really want to go this slow, because conceptually the TV frying is more interesting than Hembry just getting stabbed, but the scene itself is far worse, so I'm going to give this a 4 out of 10.
I'm sorry. <laughs> Billy Loomis is a bit of a weird one. It's more of a moment of triumph for Gale than anyone else, and he does weirdly exhibit some superhuman abilities in the final hour, which shakes up the whole narrative. But I think it's just like a triple mind game, where Randy says, this is what happens in movies, and then the audience of the film goes, that's ridiculous, that, uh, ha ha ha, stupid, funny, cliche. And then Wes Craven just does it anyways, to trick you into thinking that you knew what was going to happen. I don't know, um, about the actual scene, he gets shot in the head. It's not a great end to Jughead's dad, uh, 5 out of 10, I guess. Take a little walk. Listen, mommy. <laughs> I think this one has a bit of that final destination factor. It's so unique and specific that I think it sticks with a lot of people, or at least it, it stuck with me for the majority of my life. It's pretty gruesome, but I also think it's hilarious that Mickey put on the ghost face costume in the stall and then presumably took it back off to leave the stall. What was the point of that? Anyways, this kill is an 8 out of 10, I think. <laughs> Man, they really know how to write a uniquely scary scenario. There's like two almost Wicker Man level horror factors to this scene. First off, her boyfriend being replaced by a psycho killer in a mask and her not noticing it is really scary. But even worse than that, when she's actively being murdered in front of a live crowd and nobody is helping. In fact, they're all cheering for her to die. The psychological element of this scene really takes the basic stabby stabby slashy slashy kill to a 9 out of 10. It's elevated in a way that is is pretty modern actually. As it turns out, I just really like the opening scene kills. <laughs> Very fittingly, Casey aka Cece's death is the most honest homage the second film's killers do. It has the intimidating phone call with the little twist to it that her sorority sisters take part in the conversation as well before they leave to go to some party. Sadly, this kill is just a toss off a balcony and it's not an especially strong chase scene, so I'm gonna give it like a 3 out of 10. Damn, this hits close to home. Randy is supposed to be the horror nerd who knows exactly how to avoid these situations. I like the aspect of him checking every single person with a cell phone because that's how uncommon they were when this film came out. It's also a little bit of a hint to the twist at the end how viciously he gets brutalized for talking shit about Billy. The hip hop crew coming by to muffle the sound with their boombox is a little cheesy, but it's delightfully dated. I, I kind of like it. I'm gonna give this a six out of 10. <laughs> The only interesting thing about this is that Sid is with the police and she's supposed to be safe. I'm not sure that I love Ghostface joyriding around and causing explosions before driving into a wall like it's Fast and the Furious. And then he only wakes up at the exact right moment. It's really not good. 2 out of 10. Get this out of here. He's gone. What? <laughs> By extension of the last one, this is pretty boring. She just refuses to follow Sydney and gets stabbed. Zero to ten. This scene sucks. Pretty much the best character moment for Sydney across all of the movies, I'd say. As Mickey's little game he's playing, where he's the new Stu and Derek is supposed to be the new Billy, is what shapes her into the hard-ass, trust-no-one person she becomes later on. Again, it's held back by just being a gut shot, but I still like the narrative at play, so it's getting an 8 out of 10 from me. Mickey, there's not gonna be a trial. <laughs> I think he had an interesting motive, thinking that he could blame violent media, but then he's just shot. I don't like guns in these death ranking videos, unless you do something interesting with the gun. 2 out of 10. Try harder with the next movie. <laughs> Never mind, that's a pretty good joke. 9 out of 10. Consider it done. Cotton Weary saves the day, but still manages to be a sycophant in the process. Sydney following rule number two, double tap. Eh, I don't know. It's not it's not great. Five out of ten. Pretty mediocre. You walk to the edge of town and go across the track. Ah! 
These two share an entry because it's basically the same scene. Cotton has a bit of legacy factor after the second film, and the way this scene ups the voice changer technology to create a Goatman-like scenario where Christine distrusts Cotton is pretty innovative out of the gate. The kills themselves are basic, but it's still a pretty good opening scene. I'm gonna give this a 7 out of 10. I think it's pretty above average. <laughs> And they immediately make use of that innovation by having the real killer, spoiler alert, Roman, call an actress and threaten her. But as a viewer, you're led to believe that Ghostface is simply cloning Roman's voice because of the opening. It's genius. It's brilliant. I don't know how anyone can not see these films as horror masterpieces. The chase scene is good too, mainly because the setting of the studio of a stab film allows for a good fake out. This is a 10 out of 10. This is a masterclass in writing. <laughs> All right, movie, I'm less impressed by it the third time. Ghostface fakes Dewey's voice to get a drop on the security guard. It's a cute little fight scene, but it's just an okay kill. Six out of ten, just a hair above average. Whoever smells the... I will allow one hilarious explosion kill. Honestly, tricking them into blowing themselves up with the promise of safety is a pretty good idea, and the visual effect isn't awful for 1997, so this scene is alright by me. 7 out of 10. Good job, Roman. Good kill. <laughs> This is nothing special, but she does give some insight to the predatory nature of Hollywood on young actresses, so I'm gonna give it a 6 out of 10 just on the social commentary alone. Alright, this is all one long scene, so I have to do this pretty quick. He gets stabbed and thrown off a balcony, which we've already had both of those things, and he has a pretty good throwaway one-liner, so 5 out of 10. Just average. <laughs> The last of the triple kill scene. It's a neat idea to have it happen behind a one-way mirror to give a sense that she's like extremely close to safety when she's not at all. If only Dewey had started shooting the mirrors out the other way, he probably would have saved her, but you know, unlucky. It's a 6 out of 10. Final cut! I already have it. <laughs> the trilogy revelation about Sid's mom. I guess. Milton wasn't really present as a character, so he's essentially just a plot device for Roman's big motive. It's a 3 out of 10, it's not special in any meaningful way, and it's just a slice of his throat. I'm not really impressed by that. Step 3, right? <laughs> Out of the three films so far, Roman has the best motive and the best cover story with the fake voicemails. Also, fun fact, he has the highest kill count due to him being the sole killer in this movie, compared to the other two having two killers. I would say that while Dewey gives the final shot, and that's the clip that I used for the actual death, the kill should be given to Sydney for the heart stab. Since this is Sid's first real triumph and it ends the story of her mother, I really like this one. I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Where the viaduct looms like a bird Another shared entry. The most unrealistic thing about this is that the citizens of Woodsboro would turn Ghostface into a, like a meme or a prank when it was an actual tragedy that happened. But otherwise, this scene lends itself to the idea of the film, which is being a reboot or a remake, having both the essence of Casey Becker and Tatum Riley from the first film. I'm gonna give this a 7 out of 10 just for its purpose in that regard being fulfilled so cleanly. <laughs> A pretty creative twist on the next door neighbor sharing adjacent windows trope. Charlie convinces them that he's in one house when he's in the other. It also establishes Jill's innocence very early on, which is at this point a red flag. The stab in the hand is disgusting, and although we don't actually see the killing blow, it's one of Ghostface's more brutal attacks. 8 out of 10. <laughs> I don't care what you think, this is getting a two-point bonus just for being Annie Edison. That being said, it's filled to the core with cliches. Dark parking garage, her car won't start, and for some reason she leaves the safety of her car instead of calling the police with her functional cell phone, and it doesn't do anything to screamify those tropes, she just runs away and gets stabbed. It would be a 4 out of 10, but with the community bonus, it's a 6 out of 10. I'm biased. <laughs> 
again, for some reason, these professional police officers decide to fake being murdered as a joke, and it leads to a scenario where they're both vulnerable. The forehead stab is fucking gruesome, though, and I like how ominously Jill stands there to watch Perkins bleed out. This is another, like, 7 out of 10, I guess, just on the ominous standing alone. <laughs> One of the few scenes where both people who are Ghostface are active at the same time, but the killing blow to her own mother goes to Jill. Knife through the letterbox is pretty cool. I don't know, 6.5 out of 10? The first .5 of the video, my friends. The new Randy. The scariest thing about this one is the idea of, like, watching your friend's Instagram live and seeing this whole thing happen. Otherwise, it's just a triple stab with a cheeky little joke about the rules. I'm gonna give it a 6 out of 10. We're perfect. No, no, no. Jill's ex and the fall guy. Now, for being the fall guy, I'm not sure how they're planning on passing off the dick shot as legitimate self-defense, but somehow it still actually almost works. Guns are boring. Three out of ten. He stole the ring. Get it up! <laughs> <laughs> Pretty simple. In a way to reenact the first movie, Charlie is coaxed into thinking that he's gonna take injuries to make it more believable, and Jill just stabs him in the heart. In my opinion, this is one of the more shocking twists, and most people wouldn't expect it on the first viewing. So I'll give it an 8 out of 10. I think this might be my favorite movie, aside from the original. Clear. 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 <laughs> Aw, oh, Jill, you almost got away with it until you talked too much. Defibrillators to the skull would probably kill any normal person, but this is Scream, so she has to get back up and die by gunshot. She's probably the best ghost face to date, and I'm gonna count the defibrillator thing as what actually killed her. 7 out of 10. Doom as a ship and crap. Quentin from the Nightmare remake grew up to be a real scumbag, eh? Well, it's just a quick jugular stab, but luring him over to the radio playing Red Right Hand is a cute little meta nod to longtime fans, I guess. Six out of ten. <laughs> a lot of Ghostface kills rely on baiting the victim in. The last one, for example, but like a good chunk of them. This one uses the unsuspecting person in the shower trope, this time being a dude, which is a little atypical, but it baits the mother bear into a brutal assault. Now, I'm not a cop, and I'm definitely not a mother, but I don't think Judy, who survived the events of Scream 4, would be foolish enough to run haphazardly directly into where she knew Ghostface was. It's just not overly believable. 2 out of 10, it basically gets those two points because it happened on the porch in broad daylight, which is interesting at least. <laughs> Speaking of atypical, and at the risk of sounding pretentious, this scene plays a lot with camera angles and sound design, unlike most others in the series. Basically, it has a lot of fake jump scares that are built up pretty well, I guess. Then when the actual jump scare happens, there's no build up, obviously. Kill is just another juggler stab, but it goes all the way through and you can like see it peeking out, which is kind of gory for Scream, honestly. 7 out of 10 just for scene direction. I was gonna make some reference to 13 Reasons Why, but I really don't care that much. Uh, this one happened off screen, so 0 to 10. It's an honor. It's a bit of a mixed bag here, of course. Dewey is one of the three main characters of the series, and he might be the most likable of the three. The fight is decent, despite the fact that Dewey is being overpowered by a teenage girl, but that's almost immediately overshadowed by him getting three shots off at Ghostface, but not aiming for the head, which he very much should have, remembering from the other four times this has happened already. The kill is good, the line about it being an honor is a nod to us fans, and the dual knife stance is both cool and somehow, like, ironically funny. 8 out of 10, my major complaints would kind of break the narrative of the movie, and I don't really see a workaround to that, so I'll live with it. I know. Headshot. Boring. However, the scene is carried by the killer reveal, which is usually one of the more fun parts of these movies. 4 to 10. That's the best you're getting out of me. So our new Sydney is the daughter of Billy and has the serial killer genes or whatever from like Riverdale. So when Richie is revealed as the second killer, she absolutely brutalizes him. Since I've watched every kill in all these movies to make this video, I would say that this one is by far the most brutal, counting a total of 22 stabs and one final throat cut. Yes, I counted. She does the famous knife cleaning thing too. 9 out of 10 for being so wildly different out of our protagonist. <laughs> 
To complete the idea that this film is a requel, the OGs needed a kill on Ghostface as well. Burned to death via hand sanitizer is very appropriate for the time, I guess. Gale gets to avenge Dewey, and everybody lives happily ever after for like two years. 7 out of 10. I'm not counting Tara's headshot because it's cartoonish. In a dusty black coat with a red right hand. <laughs> Really interesting angle to have the movie start with a ghost face imitator that isn't the main story's ghost face imitator. So there's like two independent ghost face conglomerates happening simultaneously. Dark alley mass stabbing, but I like the angle of the storytelling, so 6 out of 10. Do you feel like an animal, Jason? <laughs> I don't really get the idea that like random people would be fans of the previous Ghostface and decide to finish their story. I mean, suspension of disbelief and everything, but you know, it's pretty unrealistic. In the scene, Ghostface 2 impersonates Ghostface 1's partner so he feels safe talking to the voice on the phone. It's kind of interesting and also there's something cathartic about watching someone who thought they were the big scary killer man get immediate comeuppance. 7 out of 10. <laughs> Not much to say here, Ghostface outmaneuvers a shotgun. I guess I can say that that little dome mirror thing up in the corner, I didn't know what that was or what the function of it was until I was like 23. There's your fate fun fact for the video, 5 out of 10. For some reason, this one makes me, like, painfully aware of how fragile we are as humans. It's weird, right? They're all, like, quick kills. I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense. 6 out of 10 for making me feel weird. The whole crossing from New York City apartments on a flimsy ladder thing is really high tension. And frankly, Annika was already on death's door from her stab wounds. And I don't feel like you'd send the least damaged person first and then go on like that. I feel like she should have been the first one to go across, but whatever. I also think it's funny just to see Ghostface like jostling a ladder angrily. 8 out of 10, it's something unique. <laughs> The revenge twist for a killer's motive is cool. A gunshot wound to the head isn't. 3 out of 10. It wouldn't be a modern Scream movie without having Sam go absolutely ballistic on someone. I'm pretty sure this guy wins worst dad of the century, but Knife to the Eye is still pretty stomach churning. It's weird to see our hero capable of doing that. 8 out of 10. <laughs> Again, it feels weird to give credit to the actual killing blow because Tara stabbing the back of his throat and then like twisting the knife would kill anyone, but it's a Scream movie, so he has to come back for a little gag. So we'll give it to Kirby for using the very same TV Sid used against Stu. Combining those two factors, it averages out to like mm, seven around that area. And that wraps up the films for now. Scream 7 is in development, but who knows how long that'll take. I'd like to say that the original trilogy is the best, but honestly, I think Scream 4 is probably the second best. The more modern films, I don't know. I think they're still good, but they're missing some of the heart about what makes Scream scream. It's more of a fun mystery than a meta commentary on the genre. All of that isn't really important because this is a video about ranking the kills, not the films. Will I rank the kills in the Scream TV series? Maybe. I remember it being okay. If you disagreed with any of my rankings or you just want to talk about Scream, leave a comment and maybe hit the subscribe button. Also, I have a Patreon. This video is brought to you by my two extremely dedicated patrons. Patrons, Comey and Kick Asterisk. If you'd like to join them in receiving updates, sneak peeks, and other exclusive benefits, the link is at the top of the description. That's all from me, and I'll see you next time.